Morning, church family. Uh, my name is Brett Parker. Um, our scripture reading from today comes from Acts chapter 1, verses 6 through 11. Uh, so if you turn with me there, um, this word comes to us inspired by the Holy Spirit, as if Jesus himself were speaking to us. Uh, so let's read together from the word of the Lord. So when they had come together, they asked him, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? He said to them, it is not for you to know times or seasons that the Father has fixed by his own authority, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. And you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. And when he had said these things, as they were looking on, he was lifted up, and a cloud took him out of their sight. And while they were gazing into heaven as he went, behold, two men stood by them in white robes and said, Men of Galilee, why do you stand looking into heaven? This Jesus who is taken up from you into heaven will come in the same way as you saw him go into heaven. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Well, we are continuing in the series that we have been in. And when I say continuing, we're concluding the series that we've been in, uh, really looking at who we are as a church, our covenant wheel, these values that we hold to. And, and, and I, I really believe this is very important uh, to who we are, and, and I really want you to understand this. And, and I, we spent nine weeks on it, so I hope you sort of understand it. But I really want you to understand this. Uh, at the very center of this wheel is the, what we call our convictions. We believe that we are a people the members of this church, the people that are part of this church, we believe that we are people that have been called out by the gospel. That the good news of Jesus, that he he came to earth, he he lived a life that we should have lived but couldn't. He died a death that we should have died in our place. He overcame death. He has defeated sin. He's defeated the grave. Uh, We have the hope of life in him. That this good news of what Jesus has done on our behalf, that only he could do, has called us out. It's called us to recognize, as we're going to talk about today, a whole new kind of authority, a whole new kind of order, a whole new kind of way for our life. And this gospel has not just called us out from the world, it's, it's called us together to be a kingdom people, to be a kingdom family as followers of Jesus, uh, to be his people, to love one another, to stir one another along, to worship together as we just did here. Uh, to serve his purposes together. And, and that gets us to the third point. The third point is mission. Mission. We, we've been called to go in behalf, on behalf of Christ, to go in his name, to, to make his kingdom known, to advance his kingdom to all the nations. And, and, and so these are things that are they're very central to who we are. These are things that we confess, that we believe. But, and this is what's so important about the covenant wheel. The, the Christian life is not simply a, state, a, belief, a set of belief statements, right? The Christian life really is embodied belief, okay? It's lived out belief. It, it, it's when that belief so penetrates your life that it changes who you are. It, it changes how you live. It changes how you behave. It changes the decisions that you make. And so really the outer ring that we've been spending so much time on is that it's, it's these, you know, if, if the gospel has called you out, then you'll worship the Lord. And you'll want to be drawn to other people. That, that's, an embody, that's an embodiment of the faith. If the gospel has called you out, then you'll love the saints and you'll want to be in community with others. If, if the gospel has called you out, then you'll be generous with your money and with your energy and with your time. You'll serve one another. And if the gospel has called you out, you'll want to obey the commands of Christ, including this central command that he has given the church to make disciples, to, to, to evangelize the whole world, to, to see the kingdom go forward, to be his ambassadors. And so as, as we come now to kind of the last section of this, this reach the world section, the text that we're looking at today is incredibly important. It's, it's very important to understand this. A lot of times when people look at this text, they focus on the Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, uttermost, and, and that's an important part. I don't want to diminish that. But I want to look at some other parts of it today as we think about what does it mean to reach the world. So let's, let's look at our text, um, and, and it answers a couple of questions for us. The, the first one is, what is the kingdom? What is the kingdom of God? What is the kingdom of Christ? 
you know, these disciples, they'd been with Jesus for three years. He taught them. He'd shown them miracles. They uh, were totally, their lives were totally revolutionized by him. And he'd spent all this time with them. And then, of course, it seemed like it was all lost. He was arrested. He was taken away from them. They all scattered. I can imagine the, the peril of that moment. Our leader's been taken away. This guy that we've hung everything on is dead. You know, what, what is our life now? What, what are we going to do? And then, of course, the good news of the resurrection, that, that he overcame death. He, he rose from the, from the dead. He defeated death. And he appeared to them. And, and how sweet that must have been if you're a disciple. And you thought that all was lost. But now here's the resurrected Jesus. And he appeared to them and he taught them. And, and he taught them about, and I, I really believe that two things that he spent a lot of time teaching them about is the kingdom of God and the Holy Spirit of God. Because that's really what the rest of their lives were going to be all about. The kingdom of God and the Holy Spirit of God. But they still didn't quite get it. <laughs> so when they had come together, they asked him, Lord, verse 6 here, will you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? Will you restore the kingdom to Israel? Now to understand what they're asking here, you have to have a little, you have to have a little context. The people, the people of Israel at this time understood themselves primarily as a geographical nationality. And they had been that. You know, there was a nation with land, with borders, with a king. <laughs> they had this great king, King David, who ruled and reigned, and his son Solomon, and there was all of this wealth. And really the understanding that, that most people had was that one day a Messiah will come and restore this wealth and restore this military success and restore our power and then, and I think this is important to understand, it's, it's not that the Old Testament is without any sort of missionary concern, but here's what the missionary concern is. It, then all the nations will come to us. All the nations will be amazed by us. All the nations will, will come in and see the goodness of God and see the blessing of God. This is from Micah chapter 4. I mean, you can kind of see this. You see this in the Old Testament, but you see it very explicitly here. It shall come to pass in the latter days that the mountain of the house of the Lord shall be established at the highest of the mountains. And it shall be lifted up above the hills. And the people shall flow to it. And many nations shall come. Right. So there was a, there, there was a national concern, if you will. But it was a come and see kind of concern. The nations will come and say, come, let us go to the mountain of the Lord, the mountain of Zion. The house of Jacob, that he may teach us his ways, and that we may walk in his path. So, so you see here, that the missionary impulse, uh, I, I read this week, Johannes Blau, I thought this was well said. He said, the missionary impulse in the Old Testament is it's a centripetal missionary impulse. Remember uh, centripetal force? Remember learning about this in physics, right? Why does the earth not spin out into the universe somewhere? It's, there's a centripetal force. The, the, the gravity of the sun is keeping the earth in orbit. So it's, it's something in the middle that pulls everything in. It's a, it's a come and see. It's a centripetal missionary impulse. Zion will be exalted. And so this is what they're saying. Lord, at this time, are you going to restore the power to Israel? The Persians have had it. The Babylonians have had it. The Greeks have had it. Now the Romans have it. There's these other nations that have all this authority. When's it going to be our turn? When's it going to be our time? And so their, their primary understanding of the Messiah is that he would be a nationalistic military leader that would make Israel great again. You know, That would restore their power and everyone would come and see how great they were, and therefore they would see how great God is. Exalt Israel, and then God, you'll be known too. And you know, we kind of, it's very easy for us to adopt that same kind of mentality. When I was a kid, Danny Werfel was a quarterback for the Florida Gators, and a lot of you guys are too young to remember Danny Werfel, but he was kind of like the first Tim Tebow, okay? He was like a, a precursor to Tim Tebow. And, and he was like Tim Tebow because he was a great quarterback, played for Florida. And he was a very devout Christian. In fact, Danny Werfel is still, I mean, an amazing Christian man. Walks faith with the Lord, uh, leads in a very amazing ministry. He's a very godly man. But when, you know, he was in college, I was, you know, probably late elementary, middle school. And my prayer would be like, God, make me like Danny Werfel, you know, I want to win the Heisman Trophy, right? I want to be a great football player, and then I'll do like him. Then I'll, 
then I'll thank you at my post-game interviews, you know. And, and if you make me great, you know, then you'll be great, right? I think that's the impulse here. And, and you know, we, we can do the same thing. We can do the same thing nationalistically today. When I was, um, you know, I was a pastor at First Baptist Covington. When I was, they hired me when I was 26, which was very foolish of them. But I, I went and pastored this church, First Baptist Covington. And, and First Baptist was this very historic church. It was, it was, you know, the town of Covington. It's kind of this Mayberry town. There was a lot of patriotism there. It had this very Americana feeling about it. And we would have military personnel come. Um, you know, they'd been serving in Afghanistan or Iraq. And, and when they came back and they came back into the congregation, the congregation would just erupt in applause. So great for them, which is appropriate. Again, we were very grateful for our military. But then we'd have missionaries come. And they had been putting themselves in harm's way and serving in very dangerous places. And for them, the congregation would kind of give a, you know, nice to have you. And, you know, one day I, in one of the services, I said, guys, you know, look, whenever we have a military personnel come, you, you applaud, you erupt in applause. But here we have these missionaries that are putting themselves in harm's way for a much greater kingdom, for the Lord and for his kingdom. We should, we should treat them at least with as much, um, you know, vigor and, and love and support that we're doing with the military personnel. And one of the, um, you know, guys in the congregation after the service, he said, look, Jason, I understand what you're saying. I believe in missions. But if we didn't have America, we couldn't have missions, you know. And that, and that, I think a lot of people probably think that way, you know. And, and that just shows how we can have, th that's this mentality, right? Make, make Israel great again. And then, God, you'll be great, too. You know, make us great, and then we'll, we'll thank you in the post-game interview, Lord. When are you going to restore the kingdom? When, when are you going to make Israel great? When are you going to bring the sword and it's easy for us to fold into this kind of mentality. But it brings up this great question. What is the kingdom of Christ? What, what is the kingdom of Christ really? If you, if you read the New Testament, if you read the Gospels, it, it, it's, it's kind of hard to discern because sometimes the kingdom is talked about as if it's something that's present. The kingdom of heaven is at hand. The kingdom is at hand. But sometimes it's talked about as if it's something that is kind of out there, that it is something that is to come. Right? So what is it? How do you define it? And the way that I like to define the kingdom, the kingdom of Christ, is the reign of Christ. That's really what it is. It's the reign of Christ. Do you recognize the reign of Christ? Are you living under this authority or are you living under some other authority? Has the kingdom come to you? Has the reign of Christ come to you? So during the time of Jesus, the kingdom of heaven was at hand, but not fully. It was at hand. Is he was performing miracles. He was teaching. People were recognizing the authority he had. People were following him. So there was a manifestation. It was a season with a type of manifestation of the kingdom of God where the kingdom was present but not fully present, right? The, the kingdom of God was at hand. It was known, but it wasn't fully known. We, we call this the already and the not yet of the kingdom. Or the kingdom has come, but it hasn't come in its fullness. It hasn't come in its full way. And, and obviously we see this in the life of Jesus. He was... He was king, he was the one who was reigning, but people obviously didn't recognize him. And to some degree, in this age, they were able to obviously arrest him and put him to death. Lord, at this time, will you restore the kingdom of Israel? It's a great statement here. They, they recognize that there, there is something messianic about Jesus, but they didn't quite understand all that he was doing. And how he responds, this is very important, how he responds to them. He says, it's not for you to know, and these are two important words here. The times or the seasons that the Father has fixed by his own authority. The times or the seasons that the Father has fixed by his own authority. There will come a day, and I want you to hear this, and, and maybe you're not a believer. And this is something that we as Christians believe, and I believe with all my heart. But there will come a day when the authority and the reign of Jesus will not be a mystery. <laughs> it will not be small. It will not be unknown. Everybody will recognize it. The Bible tells us that every knee, every knee, every knee, every knee, from the most saintly person you know to Richard Dawkins, right? Every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus is Lord. And what that means is that everyone will recognize the right authority that he has, okay? And really what it means to be a Christian now 
is to recognize that authority in an age where not everyone has recognized that authority. In a season or a time where not everyone has recognized that authority. You, you live in a time where people think that the government or the media or uh, money has more authority than Jesus. I mean, in fact, those things can creep into you all the time. Really, the Christian life is in this age of many authorities. It's recognizing the one true authority that belongs to the Lord and living under his lordship, living by his lordship, living in the way right now in this age where people are confused on what authority is, living today in the same way that you will in the age when, ev- when no one is confused on the authority that Jesus has, right? But he says, it's not for you to know the times and the seasons. That is a time that's coming. That's a season that's coming. Obviously, at the end of the passage, uh, the angels tell the disciples about the return of Christ. That season is forthcoming. It's not for you to know the times or the seasons. And then, of course, he gives them an instruction. And what he's about to tell them is how this kingdom is going to be known and how this kingdom is going to be forward. And it's not going to be known through some sort of nationalistic power. It's not going to be known by Israel becoming this great kingdom. It's going to be known through them, through the disciples of Christ going forward in the power of the Spirit of God. So that brings us to the second point. How does the kingdom go forward? How does the kingdom go forward? What is the kingdom? It's the reign of Christ. How does it go forward? And and if you think what I've said so far is explosive, just wait. This this gets even more explosive. This is really one of the most explosive texts in the the whole Bible, but I don't think we really understand it. Verse 8. It says, You will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, the ends of the earth. And we're going to spend this week talking about Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria, ends of the earth. That's a very important conversation. But what I want to talk today about is what it means for you to have power. What it means for you, the disciple of Jesus, to be the witness of Christ. This is incredibly relevant to us. God has manifest himself among us, God has manifested himself on earth in the person of Jesus. Jesus came. The second person of God came and dwelt among us as a human being. I love the way John says it in John 1, 14. He says, the word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we've seen his glory, right? The glory of God has been manifest in Jesus. Glory is from the only Son of the Father, full of grace and truth. And through Christ, if you know Christ, you can be reconciled to God because Christ offers forgiveness and reconciliation to God. And through Christ, and because of Christ, you can know the order of God and the beauty of God and the goodness of God. Your life can be restored to what it was meant to be. All the longing and loneliness and sorrow of your life through Jesus can be done away with and you can be restored rightly to God. It's an amazing thing what God has done in Jesus. But how does the kingdom expand, right? How do we know Jesus? How do we know Jesus now? I mean, obviously, Jesus, as we're about to see here, has ascended. He's no longer living on earth. How will the kingdom continue? And it will continue through Jesus. But it will continue by Jesus' work through his people, through you. And you see this in the New Testament. You know, in the New Testament, there's all these places. You know, Paul to the Ephesians where he says, you've seen Jesus but they really hadn't actually seen Jesus. What is he talking about there? <laughs> He's talking about they've seen Jesus in the people of Jesus, in the followers of Jesus. You've seen Jesus in us. You've seen Jesus. And that's an incredibly bold thing to say. I mean, I mean, we, we talk about this as like, as Christians. I mean, you know, they see Jesus in us. But like, think about what you're saying there. You're saying that Jesus, the Son of God, the Savior of the world, the one who manifests God's glory is seen in you. But that's exactly what this is saying. Remember when Don Carson was here? And Don Carson, he talked about Matthew 11. And it's this really interesting passage that a lot of people don't understand, and and he certainly shed light on it for me. It's this amazing passage where he he says to the followers of John the Baptist, he says, look, John the Baptist, great man, not a man born of woman better than him, but I tell you this, Even the person who is least in the kingdom of heaven is greater than John. It's an amazing passage. That means that all of us, and Don Carson said this, that means that all of us, and again, don't take my word for it, take Don Carson's word for it, right? 
But Don Carter said that even, even who's least in the kingdom of heaven, you know, the least articulate, the least intellectual, the least, I mean, the most disobedient, the person with the greatest list of sin, the least in the kingdom of heaven, if you're in the kingdom of heaven, is greater than John the Baptist. And of course, Don Carson, and, and I think he explained rightly, what, why is that? It's because we can give, we can point to Jesus, and we can point to Jesus, as we're going to see here, on behalf of Jesus with greater clarity and urgency than even John the Baptist. I mean, something that's even more explosive, Jesus said in John 14. I mean, this is one of those verses that I always think about and, and struggle to believe. I mean, I do believe it, but it's, it's unbelievable. Jesus says, truly I say, whoever believes in me will do the works that I do, and greater works than these will he do, because I am going to the Father. So you're getting the picture here. How's the kingdom going to go forward? How's the name of Jesus going to, how's this reconciling work going to go forward? It's going to go forward, and you got to get this through you. Johannes Blau, I, I just talked about it before, Jesus centripetal missionary consciousness, right? There was something at the, the middle that was drawing them in. But then he said, and I liked these words, after Jesus, centrifugal missionary conference. You ever write a centrifuge? You know what I'm talking about? We had one in Huntsville. Very proud of that. Um, it's one of our great rides at the Space and Rocket Center. But anyway, a centrifuge, there's a, there's a force within that pushes out. Before Jesus, it was a come and see it was a come and see kingdom. Come and see the glories of God. Come to Mount Zion and hear. After Jesus, it's a go and tell. Jesus, as it were, is sending his authority. He's sending his power out into the whole world. And, of course, this is exactly what we see with the disciples. They, they, they begin to go and tell in this incredibly powerful way. The question then becomes how. How? How does, how does the coin drop? How does it drop for you and for me? I mean, how do you go out in the authority? I think we know we're supposed to do this, right? We know we're supposed to do this. But we say, well, you know, you look at like a Barrett Fisher. And you say, well, Barrett Fisher, he can go be a missionary. He's brilliant. He's articulate. Um, you know, he's, all, he's much more godly than I am. That's the kind of guy that God wants to use. Not me. But that's not what the text says. It says, no, Jesus is saying, no, you, 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 you. I'm sending my power. Th- you're you're going to do greater things than even I did in the power of Jesus' name. And there's two things that you have to understand to get this. And they're in this text. The first is the ascension. So let's go back up here. I want to look at verse 9. The first is the ascension. He says, he said these things. They were looking on. He was lifted up, and a cloud took him out of their sight. And while they were gazing into heaven, he went. Behold, two men stood by them in white robes and said, men of Galilee. Why do you stand looking into heaven? This Jesus was taken from you into heaven, and he will come the same way as he went into heaven. Now, there, there's something going on in the text here that's it's a little tricky to understand. And so in you know, olden days, people would use the word heaven to kind of refer to sky, right? The heavens as the sky. But then, of course, they would also use the word heaven to refer to heaven, Okay. Where God is, heaven, the place where, where God dwells. And so what's happening with the ascension, and this is why I think a lot of Christians don't think a lot about the ascension, and we probably should think about it more, is because we just see it as Jesus going into the heavens. <laughs> Jesus is going into the sky. And he is, but he's going into the heavens to go to heaven. He, he's going into the sky to go to the place where God is to sit at the right hand of God. This is his, and, and I, the, the word that we use here for this is particular. It's his ascension. He is ascending to something. And, of course, we see this language, you know, uh, this Acts chapter 2. So Peter now is preaching, okay? So Peter was there. He saw this. And now he's preaching us about it. So we, we get a little more context than we have there in Acts 1. He says, this Jesus God raised up. And we are the witnesses. So he's he's talking about this scene. He's like, you know, back in Acts 1, we saw this happen. And he says, being therefore exalted at the right hand of God. So he's talking about his ascension into heavens, the heavens, into the sky. But he's really talking about his ascension to the throne of God. He says the same thing in in, in Peter, 1 Peter uh, chapter 3. 
Jesus Christ, who has gone into heaven, this is heaven, the place where God is, and is at the right hand of God with angels, authorities, powers, having been subjected to him. This is not just he went into the sky kind of language. This is Jesus has gone to a place where he has received a title, a throne. He's, he's, he's a king. He's gone to us. He's ascended to the throne. You know, May 6th, very important day for you Anglophiles out there. Charles III, right? I see some nons. Some of y'all non-Anglophiles, true New Worlders, don't even care. But you Old Worlders out there, May 6th, big day. Charles III, he's going to ascend to the throne in England. He's going to go to Westminster Abbey, and he's going to be crowned the king, Charles III. Now, you could go to Westminster Abbey, and you could put a throne on your, or crown on your head. And you could probably go to Buckingham Palace, and walk up the little stairs there and sit on the throne. I don't know if they'd let you do that, but you could, in theory, do that. But, but that wouldn't be an ascension. You'd have to walk up those stairs, but you wouldn't really ascend. You wouldn't be the king of England. What this is saying here, what the ascension says to us, is that Jesus has completed his work, and now he has ascended. And he sits at the right hand of the Father, And he has a kind of authority and a kind of kingdom now that is so much greater than anything that these disciples had in mind. I mean, he is the king of the entire universe. He's the king of the whole world. He has authority. All authority is his, as he says in Matthew. All authority has been given to him. They come and say, will you at this time restore Israel, right? Are you going to be our national king? Are you going to be like David? And he says to them, Oh, no, guys. (laughs) Oh, no, you don't get it. I'm not just the king of Israel. I I am the king. I am the true king. I have all authority. All authority has been given to me. Don't you see? He, He came to earth. He lived the life that you should have lived. He died the death that you should have died. He rose from the grave. He defeated death. And now he's ascended to heaven. And all authority is is his. And and from that place of authority, with that authority, backed by that authority, he says to you, now you are my witnesses. You go out in my name, with my authority, into all the earth. Take this kingdom forward. Now that will change you if you really believe that. You know why the President of the United States has so much authority, right? It's because the office, President of the United States, is backed by the whole United States. <laughs> and all of our military might and all of our wealth and all of our power. You know, Donald Trump, uh, Barack Obama, Bill Clinton, George Bush, all very smart men. They're all very accomplished. But none of them have as much authority as they did when they were in the White House. And some of them might even be smarter. They might even be better men than they were when they were in the White House. But... But none of them have as much authority as they had when they were in the United States. Why? Because the United States is not behind them anymore, right? They, they don't have the, they, they only have the authority that they have from whatever things that they've done. They don't have this, they're not backed by this massive world-leading nation. And, and in the same way, the one who has all authority, who has ascended to the throne of God, says, I, I am backing you. You go out in my name. You, you go out with my authority. You, you go out as my ambassador. And that will give you incredible courage. Listen, listen, I don't stand before you today in the name of Jason Dees. Who cares? Who cares what Jason Dees has to say? I stand before you today in the name of Jesus Christ. I I stand before you with that kind of authority. And therefore, I can speak to you with great authority. I I can speak to you with great confidence. Now, you might reject what I have to say, and that's okay. I, I Personally, I, it's not, if you reject what I have to say, I'm, obviously I'll be sad about that. But if you reject what I have to say, it's not going to crush me because it was never me that's at stake here. I, I, you're rejecting what the Lord has to say. Or you might receive what I have to say. And if you do, I'm happy about that, obviously. But I'm, you know, I don't want to get conceited in that because it's not me that you're receiving. It's the Lord. I, I stand before you in the confidence of the Lord. And that's how all Christians go out. And that's how you're called to scatter, to go out in the name of of the Lord Jesus, and that will radically change, that will radically change how you understand your whole life to be. Who are you? Who are you? Are you, 
You, you're one who's been called out to God in the name of the Lord who's ascended, who has authority to the farthest reaches of the universe, who has authority to the depths of the earth, who has authority everywhere. He's called you to go out in his name. Do, do you believe that? I mean, do you, do you live? Do you live like that? You know, it's, um, it's St. Patrick's Day week. What a great week, right? Everybody loves St. Patrick's Day. And you might be like, yeah, St. Patrick's Day, green beer, you know. But St. Patrick's Day is actually more than just the green beer. There's more going on there. You know who Patrick was? You know, you know about Patrick? Patrick, he was a kid in England, and he got kidnapped by the Celts. And they took him from England over to Ireland. He was kidnapped. He was made a slave as a child. That's how Patrick spent his whole childhood. And when he became a young man, he was able to escape. He escaped back to England, and he became a priest. And he went into ministry. And he said, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to go back to Ireland, and I'm going to preach. I'm going to preach, and I'm going to try to evangelize those people. And he went out in the name of the Lord. People said, you're crazy. He said, and I don't, I'm not crazy. He went out in the name of the Lord. And within one generation, all of Ireland was saved. I mean, the, the, whole, the whole nation was turned around because of the authority and confidence that Patrick went forward. He went forward in the name of the Lord Jesus, the one who has all authority. You've got to understand the ascension if you want to live this life. Jesus is in heaven right now with all authority, and so he sends you. But you also have to understand the Holy Spirit. And again, I don't have time, I don't have a ton of time to talk about the Holy Spirit here. I wish I had more, but he says, you'll receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. You'll receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. You know, I love this, the, the story of the disciples. I mean, the disciples, here they are. They've been with Jesus all this time. Jesus is arrested, taken away from him. And you know what they all do? They all do. Whoosh, they're gone. They hide. They're cowards. I mean, even Peter, the most courageous among them, denied him three times. But then what happens? The resurrection, the ascension. Pentecost, the Holy Spirit comes. And all of a sudden, these guys that just days before were the greatest cowards are now going out with enormous authority in front of all these officials, preaching, teaching, declaring Jesus. They're being put to death, but, but with Jesus on their lips. How? They're living in the power of the Holy Spirit. And they understand the reign of Christ. They're going out under the reign of Christ in the power of the Holy Spirit. Is that how you live? Under the power of the authority of Jesus, in the power of the Holy Spirit. You know, Jesus says in John 16, it's actually to your advantage that I go away. It's going to be better for you that I go away. Because when I go away, I'm going to send my spirit to you. The helper will come to you. The Holy Spirit himself has come to indwell, to empower us as Christ followers. And I wish I had time to say more here, but I want to I kind of move on to the last point. We've looked at what the kingdom is. The kingdom is the reign of Christ. We've looked at how it goes forward. It goes forward through you, the witnesses, who go out in the power of the Holy Spirit, go out under the authority of the reign of Christ. And then last, third, where does it go? Where does it go? Where does the gospel go? Listen, guys, I, I want us to take this responsibility seriously. You've all received something. The gospel didn't start here in Atlanta, right? You know that? Your grandmother, great as a woman as she was, she was not like friends with the Apostle Paul. Right? You know, the, the gospel, through faithful human witness, by the power of the Holy Spirit, under the authority of Christ, has come to you, to us, right here to Atlanta, Georgia. And, and in the same way, what God has now entrusted us with, he's entrusted us with this message to take it to the nations. To take it to the nations. And, and there are so many places on earth that have so little gospel access. You know, Atlanta doesn't have as much gospel access as maybe some towns where you grew up or where you're from, but it, it's got a lot. But there are some cities in the world where, where, where 
to, to hear this message would be so strange, so, so obscure. There are some places where you couldn't even say these things, these life-giving things, the, the message of this kingdom, you couldn't even say these things in a language that people understand. You know, one of the things that we're working on with our missions partners is Bible translations. And there's a people group that, that you guys have sponsored. I mean, I don't even know if you know this, but you guys are providing a Bible to the Tatar people of Siberia. It's the first time these people will ever have the, the Bible, biblical text, in their language. And we're just doing the Gospel of Luke. I mean, it's a bigger project than, than we've even taken on, but we took on the just one Gospel, and now the, that's going to be translated. But, but, but Jesus has said, no, listen, listen, this kingdom that has changed your life, that's so precious to you, that's so powerful to you, I wanted to go to the ends of the earth. I want to go to the ends of the earth. You're, you're going to be my witnesses. I, I want you to feel the weight of that. that. That's really why we're doing this this week. You know, a lot of people think, well, it's, not, it's missions week, you know? It's missions week. So it's like it's, it's shark week next week, I think. It's missions week this week, but, you know, but then the masters is coming up, right? Or whatever. It's a hobby. It's something nice we do. Oh, yeah. We're, we, Japan, it's nice. I want you all to feel this burden. No, no. <laughs> you will be my witnesses, Jesus says. We don't have Missions Week because it's a little, like, fun hobby. We have Missions Week because we want to be obedient to the command of our Lord. To, you're going to watch a video here in a little bit, and, and Sarah Stalling says something. I realize this is my purpose in life. Jesus has sent you, has left us here to be his witnesses. If not, then he would have just taken us home. <laughs> To be with him, nobody's left you here for a potency of life and a clarity of gospel that comes from your mouth to, to, to take the, the good news of salvation to the whole world. Are, are you taking this call? Is this, has this changed you at all? Has it impacted you at all? And so there's three asks, and I want to kind of reverse them. A lot of times we say, you know, pray, give, go, but I want to reverse them, and there's an intentionality about that. So first, go. You know, we... we we need to move into, in the life of our church, a, a sending place, a sending time. And I just, I want to go ahead and say, like, I want you to open your hands and heart this week and say, Lord, could you be sending me? Maybe you could be sending me to plant another church in our city that doesn't have as much gospel access. Maybe you could be sending me to another city in North America. Maybe you could be sending me to a global city <laughs> where there's very little gospel access. Is, is, that what you're, is that what my life is for, Lord? Is that, is that what you want to do in my life? Jesus, who reigns on the throne, the, the Lord of my life. It's not money. It's not my job. No, there's one who's actually reigning, and it's Jesus. The thing that's reigning in my life is not, you know, the American dream. It's not this happy life with a picket fence. It's, it's Jesus. And so whatever he says, I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do that. I, I, he is on the throne, not me. He has ascended, not me. So would you go? Would you pray about going? And then two, giving. And I put this at number two because this is very important. You know, I, I don't want us to treat giving like, ah, you know. I want to say, you know what? If, when these people are called to go, when God starts sending people from our body, when, when these partners that we have connected with, that we've committed to, we, we're, they're, they are, they are going to be supported, and we are going to give to them. We are going to, every need that they have, we are going to be behind them. We're going to be sacrificial in that. And then, of course, the last one is pray. Now, you think, okay, well, I'll pray because I sure don't want to go. And I kind of don't want to give. Well, be careful. Be careful if you sign up for pray. Pray is the da most dangerous one. Pray is the most dangerous one. Because pray, you're saying, I'm going to commune with God who loves the nations and who loves his own glory. And as I commune with him, as I seek him out for the sake of the nations, I'll just tell you, it'll change you. I, I really believe that like, the reason that I'm standing here right now, 2015, at a similar missions conference, I committed to pray for the Kurds of northern Iraq, and I committed to pray for church planners in North America. And that week in, week out, just Praying to the Lord that his name and glory would go further changed my heart and perspective on what I was supposed to do in my life. So be careful if you sign up for pray. Don't do it because it's the easy one. It's the hard one, really. 
It's the most intense one in some ways. Do you believe that Jesus is on the throne? Have you seen his glory and his righteous life? That God has sent a Savior to live out righteousness. Have you seen his glory in his death? That he died for you. That, that our record of sin, all of our sin, all of everything that stands between us and God has been done away with, has been canceled, has been put to death on the cross of Jesus Christ. Have you seen his glory in his death? Have you seen his glory in his resurrection? That he's conquered sin, that he's conquered death, that, that he has come, overcome all these things. In him, there's really is hope of life, eternal life. Have you seen his glory in his ascension? That he is now ascended, the right hand of the Father, given the name that is above every name. Let's bow to him now. Father, help us to see your glory. Help us to see the glory of Jesus. Help us to not be people that are deceived by lesser kings, by lesser glories, by lesser idols. Set our hearts right now, Lord. Give us in this moment a vision for Jesus, for his, the people that he loves, for the nations that um, he longs to be brought in to worship him. Help us to live in that authority, Lord, to live in the strength of his name. Move in our hearts now, I pray, in Jesus' name.